Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our topic for this episode is epistemology, or the philosophy of knowledge. Now, some of us know how to ride a bike. Others know how to play chess. Many of us know basic mathematical truths, and almost everyone knows that Paris is in France. We also know that this pandemic was going to end soon. In fact, we know a lot of things. But what does it mean to say that we know such and such? That is, what is the nature of knowledge itself? And why does it matter to ask such a question? Now, philosophers have been dabbling with this question ever since. And among them is our guest, the certified epistemologist, Stephen Hetherington, professor of philosophy at the University of New South Wales, the editor-in-chief of the Australasian Journal of Philosophy, and the general editor of a recently published four-volume work, The Philosophy of Knowledge, A History. So hello, Professor Hetherington. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Uh, hi, JJ, and everyone else who's involved looking on there. Thanks for having me. Okay, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. What led you to study philosophy? Oh, I don't look, it's a bit random really, I, but I can tell you, I started at university as in what we call here an arts law student and, uh, you know, I combined BA and law degree and I just ass I assumed that I was going to be a barrister and, you know, I, I'm not sure in the Philippines if you have the solicitor barrister distinction mm. yeah, for lawyers. Yeah. So I, I assumed that I, I just had a vague idea that it'd be kind of fun to get up and, and argue cases. <laughs> you know, I um I didn't know how much money they could make. <laughs> so I said, that's there's the only um well you know but um so in the, but within my first year so I was you know I took like other people so the arts degree you do just kind of I was just doing for interest I you know it's a hard thing to get into and I just thought it was um the arts was for fun I didn't I really had no idea what philosophy was like a lot of people mm. you know when they start you know looking back sure I have I was good at English and I liked. Uh, uh, quite, you know, what you might call philosophical bits of writing, but you really, really, I'm mainly concerned about running around in the playground and playing cricket and, and all that stuff. I didn't really see myself as, you know, an intellectual as such, just just a good student. But I, um, so within my first year at uni, yeah, no, I, um, I was finding law quite boring and philosophy was great. And here's the thing, which I'm sure hopefully a number of you can speak to at times, I was very, very lucky in the department, the philosophy department at Sydney University at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had, look, my very, very first class in philosophy was a small evening class just because of timetabling things with David Armstrong, you know, the mm -hmm. DM Armstrong. And so, we, so I'm there as a 17 year old just in this small room and there's, as it turns out, the great man uh, sitting there and, you know, he's just thinking in front of me and I don't think I'd ever you know, I'd never been around a philosopher and it was just unlike anything else. It was abstract. It was precise. Mm -hmm. You know, I was also doing math, pure math as well. And I just aesthetically really responded to it. And, and then later in the year, I had David Stove, who also be quite a prominent. And the, I mean, this, this is actually important because it means that you get, you know, really, really smart people thinking in front of you. And I really like the aesthetics of it. And mm. so I use that word carefully because it, it isn't just people say, oh, I want to uncover deep truths, but I can't say I thought that at 17. I just responded to the, I don't know, the, the really the aesthetics, the, the, the elegance of the thinking and the precision and sharpness and all that. Mm. And then from, so I, but later in, and then later in that year, already I was starting to think about philosophy versus law. And then later that first year, so here's a moral for all students. My main first year essay, we had six weeks or four weeks to write it. I took all the extension. I spent six weeks reading everything in Barclay, everything I could find because he was just so fantastic. And I just, uh, I at the time thought he was right. And it was just, <laughs> just exciting. So I started to just get this conviction. I really wanted to stay with philosophy if I could. So it was just intellectual. It was just that sense of like, this is real. Mm. I don't know. It was just responding because he wrote so well. It was so precise. And, if, and for those of you, I know a number of you would be interested in philosophy of religion. And, and I'm, you know, that was when I came across Barclay on that. It was unlike any other argument 
discussion of God I'd come across and that was different too. So it was all just, it was different, it was precise, it was sharp, it was really smart. Mm -hmm. So I just started, I kept going from there and I was just lucky to be able to keep sort of hanging in there and, and go from there. Okay, so aside from David Armstrong and David Stowe, who else influenced your philosophical education? Well, I had great teachers. I was able, I went, I had a scholarship from Sydney and University and went to Oxford as a graduate student, or as I referred to him, and I put my papers in each footnote, Professor Sir Peter Strawson. Mm. But he was great, you know, and so I got very lucky. I had Strawson and John McDowell and Chris Peacock and Simon Blackburn. I'm not sure if any more deep direct influences on my thinking, but it was just that general sense of, you know, you're sitting at the feet of just, you know, just that sense of real intellect, mm -hmm. uh, thinking. And then I went on to Pittsburgh and it was the same kind of thing. And just, you know, very, very clever people. I was, I was offered a position at Princeton too, and I turned it down, even though, you know, I had a, David Lewis sent me a personal thing asking me to come and we could work on stuff. And, and I really, that was fantastic. I loved it because I really liked this stuff, but I still just made, um, you know, different choice. And by the way, that's slightly relevant looking back to the, you mentioned the four volume mm -hmm. work that I've just overseen because it has been kind of a long journey in a way for me because I started it. What really influenced me at that beginning was that sense of precision and you could, his problems are still with us and they're still being discussed as live issues. And I really just, you know, as a young kid, I was really, and I just thought that was exciting. Mm -hmm. Whereas like law, I was just kind of learning stuff and it was a bit mechanical and all that. It wasn't that invigorating, but I mentioned it because one of the reasons that I chose Pittsburgh over Princeton at the time, I just thought it had stronger history requirements. And even though I did not think of myself as a history type, I've come more and more over the years to appreciate how philosophers, particularly professional philosophers, can get often too caught up in just the here and now. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, when you're bright and you get ex caught up in exciting stuff around you. And it's, of course, you should, you should get it caught up in it. It's, it's part of the thing of philosophy is the, is intellectual challenge, you know, and problems that are still with us often, but I didn't necessarily think about the history, but now I'm coming more and more to think that we, you know, you've really got to, even when you're doing the present, you've got to, you, you, you are enriched by having a sense of the history. You know, the history. Yeah. yeah. So that's why part of it was motivated to take on that. Mm -hmm. what turned into that four volume book, uh, four, four volume set, because I more and more have come to see that, you know, there is a lot of, it isn't, it's just a general sense of the depth and richness and the fact that philosophy, this is, you know, Western philosophy that I'm mainly dealing with. The Western philosophy so has been with us for so long. It comes and goes, different issues come to the front, go back, you get new bits coming in. There are persisting issues. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it deepens deepens the whole. And so um, that's so for me. Yeah, that's how it's kind of gone over that time. You know, over those three. I was very lucky, therefore, to study at three different good places with different influences, different people. You know, at at, um, at um, Pittsburgh, I wouldn't single one person out. Though I would say I was. I, my second reader for my dissertation was Wilfred Sellers. Wow. Who, um, <laughs> yeah. So it was just before, just before he died, you know, uh -huh. I was like, one of his last um, mm -hmm. people there. And um, yeah, so it was, it was, uh, yeah. And so there was a kind of a sense again, that you just, you somehow absorb that sense of depth of thoughtfulness of just, Cleverness, but not cleverness for the sake of it. Cleverness to genuinely try to work something out. Mm. And so I, I, it is actually, to me, it is quite important, I think, in philosophy. It's full of clever people, but I'm not sure everyone's always focused. Well, my own view is I, I don't know if everyone is always focused on the issues for their own sake. And but someone like Sellers was. And John McDowell was another important mm. teacher for me. Um, He's the one I discussed, I talked with him, saying, well, but Pittsburgh, Princeton, Pittsburgh, Princeton, which <laughs> to go? 
and so anyway, and then he ended up following the Pittsburgh. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's all I know. I don't. I don't always. You know, it seems a lot to say about myself there, but it is. But it was. Well, I was really, really lucky. Mm. Is how I think of it. You know, I was really lucky to get go to Oxford that scholarship and then to keep going. I and I had just really good teachers around, really smart other students, and yeah, it, it's there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of luck in these things. I think anyway. Okay, so you mentioned about aesthetic. So what, what is that word? How, how do you describe aesthetic feeling in philosophy? Well, see, I don't have a, I don't have a, so I'm using it in a way I'm giving you, at that point I'm sort of trying to convey to you how, it, when I look back on myself as a 17 and 18 year old, mm. and this is just kind of for the record is I, I have, I've never, I haven't, I don't do formal aesthetics, but I actually have it as a kind of project down the line. I want to come back to it properly. Mm -hmm. I did grow up in an arts, with an arts kind of family. My, my father was trained in art, became a, was, well, anyway, he, he, he was quite, what he did was quite famous in Australia. And when he died, he was on the front pages and all that stuff. The point being it was, he was trained was from art and all that. So I grew up with lots of art around me. And so I was, it, it, you know, on the walls and discussing. So, so I did get sensitized now. So I don't know if it's, a, I don't think it's a coincidence. So I look at the thing and I look at logic. So when I came first to you there, I'm with David Stowe and just the elegance of the X's and the Y's <laughs> and to be able to, to, to go straight to the heart of a sentence in effect with, you know, if the logic is delivering what it wants, to, says it can do, you go into the heart of a, it's like the semantics and a certain, when you talk about logical form, that again seemed really, really elegant because you're cutting through a lot of potentially irrelevant stuff. And so like when I went on with David Stove, I did a lot of stuff. I read a lot of Carnap, for example, and you know, the logical foundations of probability and stuff like that. And Donald Williams on probability and induction. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not that I'm a mathematician. I did study some math, but I'm not, you know, and then it, again, at Pittsburgh, I did extra kind of advanced logic. And again, it's just aesthetic. I, because I just like the elegance of the forms, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but again, at some point, I started to veer away from that a little because I, you, to me at least, it was it's not an end in itself. To me, it's kind of like so. For example, and particularly as editor, I like want to encourage people to to write as much as possible directly, simply, mm -hmm. so they really can be understood. And to me, that's again part of the aesthetic of doing philosophy well. So to, to me, it matters. I don't like to see like philosophical ideas lost in a whole lot of needless verbiage. <laughs> I want them. So, you know, David Lewis, why was he so great? Well, many reasons, but you know, one of the things is he was, he didn't waste words. It was, you know, he always thought every sentence was clear. He didn't. And there is a kind of, there is an elegance to the, not just the, the pattern of the thinking, but the way it's presented. Mm -hmm. And and I guess I think to me, the one of the virtues when analytic philosophy particularly is done well, of course it isn't always done well, but when it's done well, that's one of the, it's, 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 I think that is the capacity, it's, it's openness to that sort of aesthetic mm -hmm. allows the intellectual aspects to be developed more clearly to stand there more open to the gaze of people who want to think about whether these things are true or false because you know otherwise it's like you can just sort of it's like a magician's trick if you put too many needless words it's like me waving my hand here <laughs> so you can you can sort of you know you distract and all that and then it's yeah and so i really i, I think I, I had that feeling early on and I, I do remember like in my second year as a student, as an undergraduate, when I wrote a, an essay on Locke, mm -hmm. John Locke for David Armstrong. And you know, I'm seven, oh, what am I at that point? I'm 18 to 19. Okay, so you're just starting. But he, he said to me after that essay, he said something like, Stephen, I do hope that you're not going to become one of those philosophers who puts all their you know, best thoughts in footnotes. <laughs> and the point, and one, obviously one looks back and he's a guy who didn't write it. He's one of his virtues. He put everything as simple as he could. Right. And two, I always remember because it's true, you know, you can get caught up in, hang on, I've got this thing, but I've got all these other side thoughts and they're all so interesting. Mm -hmm. Put them down there and I'll just expect the reader to sort of go in there as well. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Well, I'm just starting there, but 
you know, I always kept in mind, and I can't say I've always, you know, done what he would have approved of there. <laughs> but but there's a general point there that you just try to lay things out, you try to make it clear, because you're trying to be honest with readers. Uh, uh, this is what I think, as clearly as I can put it. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay, but and you should be able to see that. Otherwise, you can put it all deep, complicated, and people spend half their time trying to work out. What, what you're really trying saying. to say, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> before they even get to evaluating it. So mm -hmm. I do, the, but so that, yeah, I, I, so I don't have a worked out theory of what it was that I was responding to beyond what I've just been saying, I think, as a, as a 17, 18 year old there. But it really, but I was very, again, very lucky because, you know, I just said Barclay, who's such a good writer, and I really did enjoy his writing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's um, it's not pretentious. I guess that's another word that comes in there. I don't like pretentious writing. Philo yeah, and philosophy, you know, is yeah. I mean, look, anything can do it. But yeah, there are philosophers who succumb to that temptation. I think mm. we've all got failings as philosophers, and one should try to be aware of one's strengths and weaknesses. But I guess personally, I just that's a particular thing I really don't like when people are like trying to show off in philosophy. I guess my view is at a certain level, we're all bright. <laughs> so just take that as a given and just now try to. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So why did you specialize in epistemology or the philosophy of knowledge? Oh, uh, look, it could have gone the other way, but um, when I, when I was choosing my dissertation, I almost did modal metaphysics. I was, doing stuff on possible worlds and essence and accident and all that um, with Richard Thomason at the time and uh, Pittsburgh. But so I, it was a close thing, but I'll tell you, it's a, in a way it's a simple thing. I've always had, I got in my second year at Sydney. So we'll talk, I know you want to ask me a little about Gettier, which mm. is always, which is a long standing thing of mine. The most exciting course I took as an undergraduate was in my second year it was Bill Lycan, who was visiting, I think it was his first time he came, he was a youngish, recently tenured guy from Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Okay, he went on to become a very well-known philosopher. But he, he had that kind of, at the time, you know, again, generalizing here, he had the kind of best of the American style in that he was really energetic and it was very much a talking kind of thing. And he, Gettier and all that stuff was very much in the air um, since late 70s. And yeah, it was the most exciting course I did. So it was like, I went off, I suddenly got inspired. I went off and started writing my own stuff. I had this idea about self-justifying, self-justifying sort of um, principles, epistemic principles. Mm. Anyway, and then he sent, you know, I started writing this thing and trying to respond and I was started engaging the whole thing. So, which, you know, for a student, I was looking back, it was pretty, you know, it was tapping into something there. And um, yeah, so I think from there, it was like, I, I just, you know, he planted a seed. I was really looking forward each week to coming, coming along the next week, which is the ideal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you want, it's pretty rare for students, but I did experience that. Yeah. And normally I just really liked stuff, liked it, but I wasn't looking forward in that way. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I was for that course. So that's really where it started. And yeah. And it was, so it was just really fun. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess jumping ahead in a way there, I'll just say this when I was ending my philosophy and my undergraduate and people say, Oh, you want to go Oh, Why? And the obvious answer is always because, you know, I really like these deep questions. And I, well, I, I didn't honestly say that to people. Of course I liked them, but it wasn't, Oh, I'm being deep. Mm -hmm. It's they're fun. And I just enjoyed it. So in a way it was just look, what do you, I mean, you know, I knew I might not get a, you know, a good chance. I wouldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. but I was, I was trying. I, I thought, well, I'll try. But, that's a landline there. But um, um, let me uh, that's new. let me just pick that. Oh, don't worry about it. You're going to hear my answering machine. So I'll talk over that. But so it really was just a case that I really just enjoyed it. And I don't know if it's the same. When I mentioned my father, he was a cartoonist and a mm. puppeteer. And I probably just absorbed that whole sort of idea that you can, I don't know, I picked it up. It wasn't like he and I were that close really, but I did pick up 
the sense of you know I had a father who was being paid well like to do puppets <laughs> on TV to, on TV you know he did it for years and draw yeah. cartoons and all that stuff so maybe it got through to me maybe I absorbed that idea of just you do the, you try to have fun so I do really honestly part that across for philosophy for young for students I honestly encourage you if you the for me the best motivation is that it's enjoyable personally the best motivation is that it's just fun mm. okay uh, so yeah. let's go to your expertise epistemology so you mentioned about the gettier problem it's one of the, the well the, the fun problems in philosophy <laughs> but before we get into that let's talk about epistemology first so what is epistemology all about and what right, makes, sure. yeah what makes it a philosophical um, yeah, yeah. Well, so look, for, again, for those of you new to it particularly, it's, um, you know, the episteme, the epistem part comes from the ancient Greek word episteme, which is usually translated as knowledge. And it's um, so in that What is Epistemology book there on your screen, I, I call it knowledgeology. <laughs> but it's the usually um, the usual. Uh, what, I don't think it'll catch on. As a, uh, I just do it as a throwaway. But uh, the th usual thing is it's theory of knowledge. So why is it philosophical? Because long ago, so we're talking at least say in the in the West, we're talking with some of the ancient Greek philosophy, most obviously in a couple of Plato's dialogues, or more than two, but at least two. Um, you get a kind of first attempt to say, well, look, we, we throw this term knowledge around. We talk about knowledge, and it seems like it matters. And it certainly seemed like it mattered there. If you're trying to think, well, for example, what, what are rulers? What makes the best ruler of a city? Mm -hmm. Well, they shouldn't just, you know, well, ideally they know various things, right? You don't just want them up there saying stuff for the sake of saying it. You want them to genuinely be giving voice to knowledge and not just trivial knowledge, but knowledge of things that matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's things that matter and there's knowledge. Okay. What's knowledge? And that's where epistemology starts. So the term has come in over. I, I, I did once know with the term when the who first thought of the term epistemology. I've, I'm not sure. I think 1800s. I can't remember. I, mm. Anyway, um, so but that's how it's translated always to start with theory of knowledge. And when you say theory, it really means theories and or theorizing. It's not like at this point there's like one theory, then you just have to learn it mm. and apply it. So the idea is that a philo epistemology, philosophers still take it as a live question to more or less greater or lesser extents, um, what knowledge actually is. So again, it can seem so obvious, but it's like saying, well, what's a person? Mm. You know, we interact with people all the time. You know, what, what could be simpler? But there really are, it really is actually quite difficult as a philosopher when you set the, and why, JJ, you say, well, what, why is it philosophy? Okay. So as a philosopher, you set yourself certain kind of standards and certain sorts of uh, presumptions about what would count as an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you say something like, what's knowledge? And then you say, well, let me, you got a good dictionary there? Let me just look it up. <laughs> well, yeah, just the other day, for interest, I did actually, because I just have a, a kind of a short, a small OED there I just had it there lying there and I looked up knowledge and you know the answers it's all over the place yeah. you know it's five or six things are listed there for an epistemologist it's like okay yes some people have thought that is the core of what really underneath it all is what it is to know something some people have thought that is some people have thought the other in the dictionary fair enough the dictionary says in effect look people use the term knowledge in all these different ways right Philosophers, for example, have often set themselves a task of this sort of task. Is there a, an underlying universally applicable core sense of what it is to know something? Yeah. Universal as in any kind of person, for example, maybe even any kind of being, you know, animals, higher beings, whatever, all you know, all countries, all cultural backgrounds, whatever. Is there anything we can say that will somehow sh unite us in a sense, show that all of us share this so that when I know something here in Sydney, if you know something there in Manila, there's still 
there's a kind of description which both of us are dis satisfying. Mm. And for the epistemologist, it's let's see if we can describe that. So in that way, it's kind of understanding something that unites us all as, as human beings in that way. So is there an underlying nature? What's the, what's the most basic, what are the most basic descriptions, accurate descriptions that we can give that would say generate all the various other things that we say about knowing? Is there an underlying picture for it? Okay, so uh, I think for epistemologists, what they're looking for is a general, universalizable, abstract, theory or description or definition of what knowledge really is. But philosophers have classified two general types of knowledge. You know, you have your knowing how and your knowing that. Is this difference, does this difference matter? And what's the difference all about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, excellent question. So, so when I say knowing, great. Mm. So when one's introduced, say when I was introduced to epistemology, people just said, we're discussing knowledge. And what they meant was, knowing that, knowing a truth, knowing that I am sitting here, knowing that you are sitting there, right? What follows of that is a sentence, an indicative sentence, I am sitting here. So that reports a truth or a fact. So when, a, when philosophers have traditionally talked about knowing, that's, you know, that's how they kind of start trying to simplify the task. Let's try to understand that. So knowing truths, what's called propositional knowledge, is the object of the knowing is a proposition, maybe a true proposition, mm. a fact, a state of affairs, how the world is, how reality is, all those different ways of putting it, okay? But particularly in the last, you know, if, well, actually particularly recently, but hearkening back, for example, to some stuff of Gilbert Riles in particular from the mm. middle of last century, but, you know, going back also, beyond that um people have thought well look but we shouldn't again we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the word knowing is is used in other ways and they might or might not all collapse back into that knowing effect so the one that's got the most attention in recent years is knowing how so here's the basic sort of initial way of trying to say, well, it might be different. When I know that I'm, I know that I am sitting here, that is me somehow in a relationship to our truth, our fact. That fact is just there, it's whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And somehow, somehow my mind or me, whatever, somehow I'm getting to record, represent, reflect, just respond to that fact. But think about knowing how. That's like that's what philosophers have meant by that is knowing how to do something. Now, so if I say I know how to uh, turn on a computer, that's that's not knowing a fact. It's knowing how to perform an action. Mm. Now, so prima facie, those are just different. But then, of course, so what philosophers, have, a lot of philosophers have given some time to, and I'm one of them, um, is to try to see if you can, e.g., for example, understand one of them in terms of the other. Mm -hmm. So there are those who are called intellectualists about this stuff who have said, look, when, you, when I know how to turn on a computer, that is because that is a matter of my having in mind various truths and then somehow I have a way of putting and that is knowing that right so I know that blah 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 and then I somehow can apply that knowing that so the idea and I make a, a movement and so the intellectualist will say something like in knowing to in knowing how to turn the computer on, I turn the computer on, so there's the action. And it's what Ryle called an intelligent action in the sense that it is applying, on the intellectualist picture, it's applying 
than knowing that that I have in my mind, which is a bunch of truths about what's involved in computers and so on. Okay. So that's um, Ralph thought they were different types. He actually thought they were fundamentally different kinds of knowledge, and so that's a, that's a live issue in epistemology. I've I've tried to argue for a hardline view the other direction that actually all knowing that is ultimately knowing how. Mm -hmm. It's a bigger you know this is a bigger argument and all that. But you know so for what it's worth, yeah, I I I I've had a go at trying to argue that knowing even knowing a truth is a matter of you having various abilities and skills. And somehow they come together and that's all it is. And so even the kind of, if you say, well, I've got a representation in my mind of that fact, that aspect of the world, mm. uh, for me, it's more something like, um, well, you might or might not, as it turns out, it might just be that somehow here I am as I move, I happen to reliably to be able to make these movements. Now, I might or might not consciously have anything in my mind that represents the world that way, but I still have that ability and that still counts as knowing how something like that. Yeah. So, oh, knowing that. Hmm. okay. So fundamentally there are two main positions here. It's either you could reduce knowing that to knowing how, which is your position or reduce knowing how to knowing that. Well, now, you could argue, like, oh, you sorry. You could say that they, they're separate. Yeah. That's another. And, then, and so that, you know, it was always too simple to, to just say that we just should be trying to understand knowing that because now we have two projects. Mm -hmm. But let's focus on the propositional knowledge because as, as you have said, the literature in epistemology focuses on this particular topic. And one theory about knowing that, the nature of knowing that is the so-called JTB theory or the justified to believe theory or account. So what does this account tell us about knowledge? Yep. Okay. Sure. So that's um, that's kind of for many. That's kind of been the default theory up to 1963, particularly. And that theory, it's a very tempting picture of what it is to know a truth, mm -hmm. or to know something about the world. And it's this: you have a belief or an acceptance, something like that. So there's something about you subjectively, which somehow has the a various a content. That's the B. Mm -hmm. That content is true. That's the T. So the content accu is accurate, right? That's T, T for true. And it's, but it's not enough on that picture to have a belief that happens to be true. You've got to have good, let's say for my rational support for it. And the term that is usually used is justification. <laughs> So it's not like you're just pragmatically or morally justified or something like that. You're rationally justified in having that belief. So, so you know, you put those three together, you, you're representing the world, let's say, a particular way, the world that you are right, the world is that way, mm. and you're kind of a rational creature in having that belief. So that's, on the JTB, that's knowledge. You've got a rationally justified true picture of how things are sounds pretty good <laughs> okay so you have the the subjective aspect part the belief part you have the objective aspect part the true part so it's a true representation of what's going on but there's also that justification part so what is the justification part doing here okay sure well that's in theory that's objective too it's just it's objective too but it can take different forms and look that's a major look there are people whose whole careers are based you know epistemology are based around trying to understand it but here's two here's i'll give you two simple uh or two classic possibilities one is and the simplest is to say you've got good evidence okay um so good evidence supporting your belief and, and ideally that's why you have the belief so, excuse me, you have that belief because you have a lot of evidence supporting it. Now, that's meant to be objective. It, it could be subjective in that, like, the evidence is a bunch of other beliefs. But if they're not randomly, let's say they haven't occurred to you randomly, but there is, and now we can get to the second part, second idea, there's part of you, like, responding, say, in an orderly, reliable, to use the key term here, reliable way to the world they come together and then here's the thing i mentioned probability and induction earlier so for example you say well here's my evidence here's a bunch of 
views I have, which are my evidence. Here's a belief I've got from them. In theory, if you look at the content of those beliefs and the content of the, that of that evidence, and you look at the content of that belief, there's a kind of let's say there's a good logical relationship between them. So you could you'd be thinking very logically and carefully, but say in going from from those that evidence to that belief. Mm-hmm. So again, that's not meant that's meant to be objective, but that's the hardest part of the picture to understand. Because um, people often say, oh, I've got my evidence. You know, who, who's, who are you to deny it? It's, it's how I see things. Yep, yeah, fine. But, you know, you, you can use evidence stupidly. You can use evidence, <laughs> you know, you, you just don't necessarily, you might have a bunch of evidence which points to P, proposition P, but you infer proposition not P. Mm. It's like you've missed the whole point of your evidence. So that's what I mean when I say like rational justification so the idea is there's meant to be this kind of close properly properly supportive um, maybe logical maybe something more broad Mm. relationship between the evidence say and the belief that you base on it something like that so again it's meant to be this kind of picture here where you've got a belief it's right and you've got clearly supportive evidence that you appreciate as such maybe and you use properly. So it's a nice little package there. Okay, and obviously you want to rule out lucky guesses, right? Or lucky beliefs as well. Well, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I mean, yeah, sure, maybe. Mm-hmm. This is a much bigger picture here because, um, all right, let me, which, you know, I'll just gesture at it. So let's say the standard view is that's right. Mm. I do think it's more complicated than that, but yeah, yeah, sure. So to get the basic, to get the ball rolling, one of the standard worries will be that it is, well, people have thought, isn't it possible even to have good belief, good evidence and still only luckily get to the truth? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was sort of trying to kind of trying to slide past that to start with, to say, well, here's your evidence and you respond appropriately. Okay. <laughs> um, to get to your belief. Yeah, you don't want it to just be purely luck. But all right, let's maybe keep it like that. So you don't want it to be just luck. That's true. That's true. You want it, ideally, you want it to be a good, a good kind of close rational connection so that the belief, the true belief you've got is, let's say it's something like it's the, it's, for the moment, let's say it's it's a kind of the right response or it's a rationally right response to that evidence, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Does that deal with what you're thinking right there? Right, right. I'm All just right, thinking okay. about justification in that way. All right. Okay, well, so- it is relevant, yeah, because, for example, look, most justification we have is not conclusive. Right. You know, and that's just a fact about how we think. We very rarely... You know, that's why people talk about like a God's a God's eye perspective or something mm. like, well, literally a God's perspective, you know, a, a perspective. We don't have it. You know, let's say if we ever have it, it's incredibly rare. And <laughs> let's, you know, it's let's I'm happy to say we never have it, but okay. So which means that there's always some slippage. Mm-hmm. Which means you're always trying to work with the best evidence well let's just say, you know, reacting with, you know, in practice, we've all got practical constraints mm. upon us and you don't have unlimited time and unlimited brain power and unlimited perfect perceptual capacities and all that. So you're usually dealing with hopefully pretty good evidence on the basis of which you hope that most of the time, at least you're going to be right. Mm. But um, you know, you also, in my view, you know, I'm a fallibilist about this stuff and I'm happy to accept that, you know, you, you won't always be right, but I don't think that means that it's irrational or that you're just guessing. No, okay. You know, when I, you can, and we make this distinction all the time, you know, we look with students, you know, say, you know, want good reasoning mm-hmm. in essays. You know, I would say to students in essays, I say, I re- here's a question. I really don't mind, and I mean it, and I, they can see in how I teach. I really don't mind what conclusion you reach here, but I want to see the reasoning. 
We we'll want to see you develop an argument. And that's what I will, I honestly will, I say, I'm not necessarily telling you what I think about a view. So you just go for it and trust me. But I want to see the argument. And that's the point about using evidence mm. carefully and thoughtfully. And as I said before, I use, I use that term that's been very influential, thanks to Alvin Goldman, uh, reliably. Like a reliable thinker in epist for epistemologist is someone who's, let's say, good at getting to the truths. Mm -hmm. Might not be perfect, but well, you won't be. But you're, you're good enough, let's say, for the moment. You're good enough at getting truths. Okay, so before getting into your main position, which is fallibilism, as you have mentioned, uh, there's another thing that we need to discuss. So from the 1960s to the present day, many epistemologists are concerned about the get your problem, which is supposed to be a counter-argument to the JTB account of knowledge. Now, you have devoted a whole book, as you can see here, <laughs> on this particular subject. So well, what is the uh, get your problem all about? Uh, what, are your okay. thoughts on, well, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> In a few minutes. Um, no, I say that because everyone always thinks, you know, that, hey, I've got it. But it's true. Okay. So the Getty, let me just say for people who are new to it, the Getty problem, it's all it's all down to one 90s, very, 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 very short 1963 essay by, Alvin, by Edmund Getty. Um, and in it, so we just had you, I just took you through the basic idea of the JTB definition of knowledge. It really it was meant to be a definition, knows in knowledge equals, you know, defined as a justified true belief. Mm -hmm. And Gettier, Edmund Gettier had a little paper in which he argued that one direction in that definition fails. So a definition says it's a two-way arrow and a two, it's like saying whenever you, so you can reason each way. His knowledge that, if something's knowledge, that means on JTB, that means you can infer perfectly that it's a justified true belief. But you can come back the other way too. Because it's a definition, it goes each way. That means when if you were looking at something and saying it's a belief, oh, I can see that it's true and it's yeah, you know, it's well justified. So yeah. therefore, apply J to B, it's knowledge done. Mm -hmm. Gettio came up with two uh, stories, fan, just imagine stories, in which he argued that he described someone who supposedly had a belief and it, he showed how it was true in these stories. And it, he sketched a line in which you could say that these beliefs really were justified. Not perfectly, but no problem. That's fallibility. Mm -hmm. But they were justified. But, and then he, you know, he had a few words about this and left it to epistemologists and they most almost all agreed that these beliefs were not knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very quick, I mean, that's a schematic thing. I'll give you not one of his because they're more complicated, but there's a really nice one that I came from Roderick Chisholm a few, three years later, which I just sort of like to use. And you can go out, maybe you can go and think about this kind of case. It's, um, so you just imagine you're standing outside a field. It's called the sheep in the field case. Mm -hmm. You're standing outside the field. You look in, you see this, that good sunlight, no problem. You look in, looks like a sheep. You see this thing, it looks like a sheep. We can add details. It smells like a sheep, sounds like a sheep. <laughs> anyway, you know, but anyway, it looks like a sheep, no problem. And so you just think to yourself, oh, there's a sheep in that field. Mm -hmm. And there is, but it's not that thing. That is a dog disguised as a sheep. And when I said sounds, smells, like let it be a fresh kind of sheep fl a fleece put over it. So it still smells. And maybe there was a recording of a sheep attached mm -hmm. to it. Anyway, but there is a sheep over a little hill. So mm -hmm. it's hidden from, in the field. So there's a sheep in the field. So your belief is right. You are justified because you're looking in normal circumstances at a thing in the front of you, which looks just perfectly like a sheep. So you infer there's a sheep in the field, but the usual line is, but you don't know. And people often say, you don't know <laughs> that there's a sheep in the field. They like to emphasize it. Mm -hmm. I prefer not to, but anyway. So there, are, but that's the question. So that's a Getty question. So that would, the idea would be, so the term people come to talk of Gettier cases. And the idea is you can think of these cases, you can make them up. Um, and so the idea is that that's a situation. And so the idea is think about it again, tie it back to JTB. If that works, you're talking about someone forming a belief, there's a sheep in that field, mm -hmm. which is true. It's made true. 
by the thing you can't see. But you actually are justified for the belief on the basis of the stuff you can't, the thing you can see. But goes the line, but surely we wouldn't call that knowledge. Now you think it is, and it's, but this isn't about your perspective. This is just us looking on, evaluating. Mm. And so the idea as epistemologists, we surely would look on with all that data and say, you don't actually know, even though you do satisfy JTB. Therefore, as Gettier inferred, JTB is false. And what that meant was for epistemologists from 63 on, and it's been an ongoing sort of battle, <laughs> um, what is knowledge more fully? Right, remember, we started the discussion, you know, earlier by saying, look, if epistemologists are trying to discover what knowledge, even propositional knowledge, was just what it is, now, if he thought the JTB could be what it was, and then Gettier seemed to say, well, that's not quite right. People thought that it would be easy to amend the definition, but it hasn't proved to be so. Mm -hmm. There've been definition after definition. There's been different theory after theory, lots of interesting ideas over the years as to what else we should be looking for mm. genuinely to be getting to the heart of what it is to know. Just what is, what is it that we take for granted in situations that, for example, isn't there in the Gettier case, is being failed in the Gettier case, mm. but is not being failed when we really do have knowledge, right? That was the, that was the challenge. Tell us what's the difference between normal good case, cases where we get knowledge and like a Gettier case where we don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, it's, not, it's very clear, but it, it's, it's a, been a really big challenge. And I just look, there was a 1983 book on it, which is a bit of an overview by Robert Shope. And then I don't think between that book and mine, which is 2016, paperback 2018, mm -hmm. very affordable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, I'm just, uh, I'm sort of joking, but it's, but honestly, it's, I don't think there's people have there's been tons of papers after papers after papers, but people, here's the thing, people, it's becoming more and more the case that students and younger philosophers just take for granted certain assumptions about Gettier cases. Anyway, I got, well, I've got, just got more and more frustrated <laughs> over the years about a lot of that. And I come in with the book or I try to look, I've, it's a, I'm looking back on 50 years, pretty, pretty much there of stuff. And I'm saying there's been these underlying reasons why no one's, it hasn't, no one's solved it. I have a go at a bit of a solution myself, but with some different presumptions. So it's the idea that even when you talked about, like, suppose we said, let's eliminate luck. It's just lucky you're right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not so simple to do. I know it makes sense. I know, like, you know, I'm like all of you, I understand. We say, oh, that's just luckily true. Mm. Of course, I understand that sounds right, but it's not so easy to make sense of that. So that's why that book, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's, you know, that's why I go into in detail in the book, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's been a long history since the Gettier problem was published in 1963. And a lot of people were adding conditions for the JDB. So you have yeah. Goldman and all those people. Now, what are your thoughts? here in the Gettier problem. So how do you solve it? Well, I don't know. I don't think any, any, I mean, I know this sounds bold and brash, like I'm still that brash 17, 18 year old, but it's, <laughs> well, actually it's sort of true. I still have that youthful. Um, it's true. I don't think any of those approaches have sort of been trying to have, have um, been right. I try to identify a few problems in the, in the book and they do take a fair bit of detail to go into, but I mean, I, I'll just tell you one quick, simple line is that, quick idea is if you're into for any of you interested to chase it up i don't think that people have really stayed true in trying to solve it they haven't stayed true to the underlying spirit of fallibilism the cases were set up gettier explicitly said that he is taking it for granted that justification the kind that can be play a role in our ordinary knowing mm -hmm. can be fallible and fallibility here means that even when you've got the justification, of course you justify it, but there's always a possibility of being wrong. It's like, you know, you live your life, you're hoping to get knowledge, you're hoping to know facts around you, but you live with the, the sense of human fallibility that even when you have knowledge, you know, there's always a possibility you're wrong. You hope you're not wrong. You try to be as rational as you can be. Mm -hmm. 
of course, but a fallibilist like me will always try to make sense as an epistemologist. I try to sh show how you can coherently build into that optimistic picture, in effect, a, 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 what's the word, uh, like a perennial or a sense that you could be wrong. Mm -hmm. See, many people think that sounds so weird. I know, but I could be wrong. <laughs> well, okay, so that's a challenge to make sense of that. But I don't think in, I, I actually do, I, I'm really not sure that for a lot of people, when they've responded to Gettier cases that they, let me put it this way. When I give you that sheep in the field case, and for all of you who are hearing it maybe for the first time, let's say, and you say, yeah, that doesn't sound like knowledge. Well, I can't prove this for you right now, but I'm just saying for you to go and think about it, I would say it's a challenge. How do you know that if you said you don't think that's knowledge, how what quality control have you applied to yourself there such that you know that you're applying a fallibilist standard? Hmm. Isn't it possible, and I have like a chapter on this particular thing with about experimental philosophy and intuitions and all that. There's a chapter on that in the book, but and it's on this idea. Isn't it possible? that you are, without realising it, you're reaching for what's so tempting for many of us to be applying like an infallible standard, as in, well, if I don't, if I could be wrong, and then I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I could be wrong, so I don't really know. No, a fallible will say, forget the angst. A fallible has to be able to understand the idea that, well, I could be wrong, but I do know. Mm -hmm. And so don't reach too easily for the, oh, I could be wrong. So I don't really know. See, that's an infallibilist. So I, part of the thing I argue for there, which is one, one of the lines of argument is at one point um, that if you, the Getty cases are meant to be testing a fallibilist picture of knowing, mm. right? JTB, but where the J can allow justification to be good, but fallible. That's the classic picture. Okay, but you shouldn't react to cases by covertly, you know, unwittingly, somehow really retreating into some little, some infallible picture. Mm. You've got, so I just throw that as a challenge for any of you, you know, coming to this, if you want to go away and look, chase this stuff up, you know, just try to see how you can know that you're really staying as a fallibilist. It's so tempting. Mm to just fall back into the, what really is just an infallibleist response, which is the old, oh, oh, if, well, if I could be wrong, then I don't really know. Mm -hmm. you know notice how the term really gets in there so often. And it's such a, and there's just no quality. To me, there's no quality control on this, these kind of so-called intuitive responses. I, I just, I mean, in a way I argue at one point, look, if it's, if, it, if you're really going to call it intuitive, well, look, look how intuitive infallibleism is. It's like you have to learn to just relax around mm. possible mistakes and just live with them. That's part of living as a fallibilist. You do your best, but you don't get scared by every possibility of mistake. Oh, so it's, it's a kind of intellectual humility as well? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's right. That's a good way to, good, good phrase to bring in there. It is, yeah, it, it's a, yeah. So there's a bigger picture here. It's not just a technical kind of, I mean, technicalities are fun. Mm -hmm. But there is a bigger, there is a bigger sense in this that there is humility that you really see. It goes each way. You're you, you're humble, but you're also you do think we have knowledge. So it's like you don't give way and just say, "Oh, I'm humble, and therefore I have no knowledge. I have nothing." <laughs> uh, the history of science, for example, uh, scientific knowledge is a whole topic in itself. But you know, like you simplifying, you're sure presumably you're going to look on and say, "Look." I mean, Karl Popper was big on this. You've got to say that the history of science is a matter of fallibilist progress. Mm. You know, we've often thought we knew things which it turned out we didn't. Well, that's just because it turned out they were false. Okay, no problem. That's just sort of failing the, the truth condition. But we keep going. And it's always fallible. But slowly, hopefully, you accumulate enough truths. Mm. And it seems fair enough to call that knowledge. We don't always know whether we know. There are times we think we know something and we don't. 
but there are other times we think we know something and maybe we, we do we do just never perfectly just never infallibly and that's that's how science works and i think it's how most of us work okay speaking of uh, the history of knowledge and history of philosophy ah uh, yeah last year in 2019, you and your collaborators published a four-volume work, a monumental work, The Philosophy <laughs> of Knowledge, a History. So it's a historical tour of how Western, quote unquote, philosophers thought about the question about, yeah, thought about the question about knowledge. Well, what inspired you to do, to do this project? Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm very glad I did it. And um, it's, it was actually an approach from the publisher, but it was from Bloomsbury, Colleen Coulter at, at uh, Bloomsbury. I'm giving her a mention here because she's great mm -hmm. and she's extremely supportive and, you know, very encouraging editor. And, uh, you know, that's important. So it was, it was like, a, it was intended. She, she proposed it to me. It was a follow up. She didn't propose it as a four volume book. It became so big that she then said, as a, a it was originally envisaged as, you know, one volume, but it was going to be so big. It was meant to be a follow-up. Have you seen, as a, there's a similar book on scepticism. Right. Uh, from, uh, edited by Diego Machuca and uh, Baron Reed. And this, and Colleen, in the end, they came, up close, came out more closely in, in time, closer together in time. I don't remember theirs, but because they were, theirs was pretty delayed, whereas mine was pretty much on time. Mm -hmm. um, so she, it was meant to be because there's this skepticism, you know, there's like tons of great history stuff in it. It's a contemporary stuff. So in a way, and she, and Colleen proposed to me because I'd worked with her on another book and she said, would I be interested in this? And I thought, I got to tell you, at first I thought of, thought, ah, oh, this just sounds so big. <laughs> I kind of sort of in a way kind of let it slide through and then, you know, it could have gone away. But then she came back to it and said, well, you know, we were talking. Have you given more thought to it? And I thought, look, you really, I really should and I could do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm a fairly well-organized person, though, you know, there was a lot of, it was a lot of work, yeah. but it's back to what I said about the history thing. I, I don't think I could have done this and I, I wouldn't have been motivated to do it so early in my career. Um, but as I say, I've come to have more and more respect for this whole sense of the sweep of things. I also see, you see, for example, here's a quick little point. I've spent all those years thinking about the Gettia problem, which is contemporary epistemology, you know, a paradigm contemporary epistemology. There's nothing more, paradigmatic and I do find it frustrating when people just simply think here's an account and what's and then they make up cases and they give intuitive responses mm -hmm. I don't do that I don't argue by saying well here's my intuitive response I just I try to fashion theories and just see how they can work together with other theories I just don't like that whole way of doing it and one reason is I look being honest I think it's kind of superficial and it's just a quick I don't know what it really proves other than gee some of us right now talk a particular way which is you know, i welcome experimental philosophy on this because quickly wow. i'd always suspected that the gettier stuff was not as straightforward as you know people thought did they all look at each other nod and say oh do we think it's this yeah yeah we all agree well i always thought it wasn't so simple so the experimental philosophy stuff the stuff for those of you who knew it it was the idea of like it's been going around for nearly 20 years and the idea initially gettier cases featured and it was let's ask people on the street what do they think and not it wasn't so simple people out in the street many non-trivial number it seemed percentage were willing to say well there is knowledge here mm -hmm. okay so here's my point it's a long-winded answer but my point was i was starting to find it somewhat frustrating the contemporary stuff because i don't think it's i i, I don't know if that's the only way to make progress <laughs> in thinking about these issues. And so I wanted to have, again, let's have in front of us a, a lot of, you know, theories and ideas from across the centuries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we're going through right now, contemporary, who knows, maybe in a hundred years, the stuff that we do right now will just not be so well regarded. Who knows? How can we know? <laughs> you know, seriously, I, I do, you know, you've got to, again, humility. We should have humility as well about, you know, contemporary does not entail 
entail better mm. in every respect. You know, I've recently been going back. I edited this year. I've got I co-edited a book with uh, Nick Smith, uh, the the Plato Nick Smith, and it's called what is it? What the Ancients Offered a Contemporary Epistemology. So we've gone back there again. It's ancient Greek, uh, mm. some ancient Greek philosophy, and trying to look at it again, blend contemporary epistemologists with ancient ancient you know uh, people who do ancient epistemology bring the two together um, again it's in the same sort of project let's try to learn from each other and um, so that's what motivated that's what why I got excited about the project and um, yeah when Colleen said you know I think maybe we should divide this into four volumes and I think oh, <laughs> gee. and that's when I brought in you know and I brought in uh, the other the editors for the first three volumes you know because you know I could have had a go at it and I'm sympathetic and I am, you know, reasonably well educated in the history of mm -hmm. things, but I'm not a specialist mm -hmm. in ancient Greek and let alone medieval, which is medieval has, has been neglected. My upbringing, you know, in philosophy, no one did it. Or Peter King at Pittsburgh I was the only person doing it in my, edu my education. It's only slowly mm -hmm. been coming and I've been trying to encourage that recently. I've been doing a lot more reading in it myself recently metaphysics as well and um yeah there's just lots of good stuff there you know? and um so what inspired me basically was because i was asked to do it and then i thought let me bring in and collaborate mm. with these others and in effect it's like me also as someone who's known mainly for the contemporary i wanted to show look i'm open to what you guys do and let's come together on this stuff and let's have a kind of big package so people can see as a whole that epistemology is, because we always say, oh, it began with the ancient in West, in the West, began with ancient Greeks, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, well, yes, but, you know, but there's been lots and lots of thinking. We all sort of say that, mm -hmm. but I wanted to lay it out so people can go to it and really see a lot more stuff. Yeah, it's, and you mentioned that this philosophy of knowledge, a history, is a living history. So it's an interaction, an, an ongoing interaction among people. Yeah, yeah. And if people like me, particularly contemporary ones, reach back and make that kind of link, it brings, so that, for example, people who do, say, medieval philosophy stuff, that they're not just off just by themselves and that's that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's good if people like me who are, you know, focused mainly on the contemporary for our own actual writing can look and build the bridges and all that stuff. And, you know, overall that enriches it. And the end of the day, I, you know, I walk away and I'm not literally doing the medieval publishing the medieval, but I've helped bring it together for others to come and they can look at the book and they can hopefully read it all together and get something out of that. So, yeah, it, you know, it's in a way it's, you know, we're here, we've got a certain time, we do what we can and that's, you know, and then you leave the, do that for, I hope it helps others. Yeah. And I know that sounds past, but it's true. That is actually how I see it. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. What do you think is the future of epistemology and how would this generation of philosophers contribute to it? Um, yeah. Well, I don't, look, who can say? I, um, you know, it's been epistemology, you know, areas of philosophy come and go. I've been at it long enough to know that some different areas have their time and epistemology has been is particularly busy there's been lots of really good young philosophers particularly come into it mm -hmm. you know in the last couple 10 20 years etc um and uh that can only be good and well sorry it, with one caveat the only way i ever have well in about any area of philosophy but i see it sometimes it's a danger in epistemology so i put it out there there is a danger sometimes of people, especially if certain dominant ideas get in place, people just start thinking they just have to follow along with that. Mm. So when I started to say it can only be good that you get a lot of, you know, good energetic younger philosophers coming into epistemology. Yeah, that's absolutely welcome. And my only thing I can say is I sometimes I've, you know, because I've been around longer and I sometimes say to some of them, look, okay, but, you know, epistemology, some of them, I think, aren't reaching back far enough. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay, but well, maybe I wouldn't have either at that point. But 
but it's like, okay, again, just be aware it's been going a long time. And so stay open for new ideas. Mm-hmm. So I guess I said it earlier that, you know, I really do. I said uh, five years ago when I had, I had a sabbatical at NYU and I was saying to one prominent philosopher there and I said, look, isn't it possible, just possible, that none of the people that we think right now is of as being, you know, the, our best philosophers, isn't it possible that none of them will be cared about in 100, 200 years? Mm-hmm. Now, his response was, oh, no, I, I find that I can't take that. Well, look, I'm not thinking it of any, but you've got to stay open to new ideas. We don't know where we are in the sweep of the history of this thing. Mm. So I personally am optimistic, but you know, we might all still be within Plato's cave. <laughs> this. We hope not. And that's why you have to keep pushing and trying for new ideas. Mm. But um, yeah, so look, I'm always an optimist about it. It's part of, as I say, as I said, when I was an undergraduate, it really was a motivation for me. And when I thought, look, I'm hearing, people like Armstrong and others talk about it. And part of what I perceive in philosophy is it's not all been solved. Mm-hmm. And I really did have that sense of, look, I can get in. Maybe I can, maybe I can try to solve something. Maybe I can, you know, accomplish that. Uh, who knows if I have or haven't or ever will, whatever, but you give it a go and it's a motivation. And so, you know, we're all trying to, you know, do our little bit to try to play a part within the, the bigger picture of philosophy and 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 so i'm optimistic in the sense that so long as people are still coming in with that sort of with sort of motivation to try to work things out Mm. it's to me it's not just a job it's not just another job it's i guess i always think philosophy should be special you know i could have just gone and finished finish my law degree if i just no insult to anyone who's doing these things but for me at least it would, that would have just been another that would have just been the job but for me it didn't have a, that special feel the, the study of it um i did some law subjects for over three years but um it just didn't have that feel but philosophy did and so i while ever i sense that you know particularly younger people still having that motivation to try to get in there and work things out and have be open to new ideas, then I stay optimistic. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the career in academic philosophy. So you've been a philo- an academic philosopher for most of your life. You've experienced the ups and the downs of this career. So what <laughs> advice would you give to the starting academics or those who want to start academic careers in philosophy? Well, look, I just said that I think philosophy is special. So that's my own view. So my own view would be think about why you want to be a philosopher. Mm -hmm. I was very clear that, look, if I don't make a, you know, beget a job in philosophy, it's been, look, it's, for those of you, as you know, it's very difficult, but it's been difficult for decades. Um, So you've got to know your value. You've got, because academic, career there'll be tons of rejections there's a lot of frustration you know trying to publishing in philosophy in some ways is more difficult than most areas i remember a history dean i had back in one of my promotion steps he said to me you know gee where's i submit to journals that only accept say 25 percent i'm thinking wow that'd be that'd be pretty uh good to get <laughs> you, know, the, um, you know the top philosophy journals are way harder than that and it's and it's a fact the american philosophical association did a study this years ago and i, I don't remember what they came up with they were trying to work out why is it so if why is our publishing rate so low so i say this that you can only go into it if you've got to be prepared you've got to have a thickish skin you've got to be prepared because publishing is important it always has been but it's professionally it's even more so and you know the You've, you've got to do it. You've got to want to do it and you've got to want to do it because you really like, my view is you shouldn't just do it because it's a career and oh, publishing is what they expect. My view is you do it because you want to think through things. Publishing is the hopefully the progression of that and associated with that is the career. 
but you know, as I said, everyone in philosophy is bright. And my experience is that everyone in philosophy could do other things. You know, it's so to me, it's not, it's a special kind of job. As I said, my father made a career doing, you know, is it from political cartooning and then puppets? Gosh, it's how, how lucky is that? Mm -hmm. It's very rare. So my point is I saw that up close. You do it because, you know, it's something, because I saw that someone doing something, he really just wanted to do it. And he just happened to be able to make a career. Now I view philosophy a bit the same way. I, I know that sounds easy, but I did even early on, you know, all the way. I did think I might not get a job, but I'm doing it right now because I really like doing it and I'll give it my best shot. And as I say, then once you go into it, it's, it's very, look, JJ, as you say, ups and downs, that's true. You can have periods where you really struggle to publish, where you, your stuff isn't right, you're not, you get rejections. I've had tons of rejections over the years, especially early on. You just, you just, it's very frustrating, but you've got to live with it. And you've got to be prepared always to be realistic and to learn from it and to just keep going. If you've got to keep, if you really like doing philosophy and that you shouldn't be a philosophy academic unless you just really like philosophy for its own sake, I think. Because I said, you can always do something else, <laughs> which, you know, it's, it's just true. Um, but for you, is it is the career worth it? Well, I yeah, I look at overall, yeah, I like, um, I still like philosophy. I, I'm, um, and I've still got things I want to do in philosophy because I want to write them, things I want to write. For me, the motivation originally, look, I think the social justification of what we do is the teaching. Mm -hmm. um, but that, to be honest, that's not personally, purely what privately, what actually motivated. It's not like I said, I want, I mean, I've been a pretty good teacher and I'm, you know, I give it energy and effort, but it's not what actually motivated me to become a philosopher. It's because I just, as I said before, I wanted to think about stuff and write. So I have written a lot and that's not because anyone asked me to mm -hmm. I just wanted to do it. If I go too long without writing, I get really awkward. I don't I feel awkward. So it has been worth it for me because overall, but there's frustrations. Sure. There's, um, yeah. But overall, yes, I do think philosophy, an academic philosophy career in some ways is very, very privileged. You know, when I look back on it, I've been, I've been paid for many, many years to do philosophy. And there's frustrating things, you know, when you're part of an organisation, there's a lot of stuff you don't necessarily want to do. Mm. But, but that's the price. Again, I learned early in life, even my father doing stuff, which who could be, he had was so privileged, he made a career out of doing absolutely what he wanted to do. But I know there were times it was even there where things were boring. He didn't want to do it. So I learned that lesson in my early in life. No one was more privileged than him in a sense. And yet even then there were things. So I, that's true. I still think it's, it's, if you can make a career, if you can be paid in this world with so many people suffering and so many people having so many denied so many opportunities and everything, mm -hmm. You know, you got to remember, there's nothing, most of us, there's nothing that special about most of us. And if you can make, if you can be paid to do that, to work out your own thoughts on something. So when I look back, like choosing not to stay with law and be a barrister, I would have, I would have, it's like, oh, this week I'm arguing for that. This week I'm arguing for that. This week I'm being told to argue for that. No, I can argue for whatever I want to. It's, there's an integrity to it that you can live out potentially. So I look back and think that's been valuable and privileged. Um, so it's, in, I'd, I've never thought of it as really just in a way as our job. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, and I don't think, Oh, it's a vocation. I could only have done that. I could have done lots of things, mm -hmm. not just intellectually, but emotionally. I could have done lots of things. You know, if I'd gone back and finished a law degree, I probably would have done environmental law and worked for environmental stuff back then but just lots of things. Um, and we all got options, I hope. But if you do it, you should, I guess my view is philosophy, you do it hopefully, because you really think it's, it's really interesting. And you really, really, my, for me, it was I really try to want to work things out. And in my view, I look back and I think, yeah, I can take some pride in some of the things I've written. 
I do. Um, I do think I've. I think personally, I've. I have been right about some things, and I've worked out some things. But that's what I think today. Ask me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on that note, thanks again, Professor Hetherington, for sharing your time with us. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers.